Memorization kind of gets a bad rap in the test prep industry and in this video I'm going to talk to you about how not only can you memorize your way through the MCAT but you're going to have to. Really there's only two ways to truly like learn material and, and one is like conceptually understanding it and then the other is memorizing the details and they're both paramount and they're both irreplaceable but they also both have a place. When you can conceptually understand material it does stick a lot better. It does allow you to remember things and recall them quickly and it allows you to apply them to test materials and specifically the MCAT a whole lot easier. But occasionally there are sciences that are just not amenable to you like conceptually understanding. Like there are pKa values of the amino acids and you can use concepts to kind of narrow down what those pKa values may be, but it's impossible for you to like look at the structure of aspartic acid and know that its pKa is 4. I'm not sure if that's right, but that's a good example. Some things you're gonna have to memorize. And for those of you that are like, why should I trust this random dude that looks like he's filming a video from a hotel? My name is John. I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm actually in a hotel. I am on an away rotation in Michigan right now, learning from some of the surgeons up north. And before I came back to medical school, I was actually a professional MCAT tutor for one of the national MCAT companies. I've been consulted on others and I spent some time as a freelancer and professional MCAT tutor before I chose to go back to medical school and start this company and the Associated YouTube channel with my co-tutor and my sister Maggie. Our goal is for you to become a colleague of ours, for you to become a doctor as well, and we think the best way to do that is through purchasing the courses that we have, but for those of you that can't afford it or are studying on a budget or something of that nature, we make these free videos so that no student interacts with us without having professional quality MCAT tutoring. So whenever I'm teaching a student, my main focus on them when learning the content is for them to learn concepts. And I really teach this in like a three-step framework. The first step for learning concepts is that you're going to have to learn things at a 10,000 foot overview, and then you're going to have to learn the nuances, and then you're going to have to learn how they apply in different scenarios. So let's say, for example, you are studying enzyme kinetics and you're talking about the reversible inhibitors. So we're talking about like non-competitive, competitive inhibition and things of that nature. The 10,000 step overview is to understand what we're actually talking about. So we're discussing an enzyme and how that normally functions in the human body, how it functions as a catalyst to speed up the rate of reaction. And it's doing that by lowering the activation energy and making the transition state more stable. And then to kind of round out that 10,000 step view, you would need to understand that competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive are the main inhibitors that you're discussing on the MCAT. I know some companies teach mixed inhibition, but I've never actually seen that tested on the MCAT. And unfortunately, I took it four times before I finally figured out how to take this test and, and created the strategies that I share with you in our courses and on this channel. So now that you've got these three columns of competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive, you need to start diving into each of them individually. We need to start learning some nuances. You need to learn where they bind. Are they binding at the active side or are they binding allosterically? You need to be able to picture that in your head. And then you need to learn how they impact things like the KM, how they impact VMAX, and things of the nature. Now it may sound like the KM and the VMAX and things of that nature are kind of uh, details that you would want to memorize. And this is where I want to urge you to dig a little bit deeper into your conceptual understanding so that it makes a little bit more sense. So for example, I would ask myself, which one binds the enzyme? Which one binds the enzyme substrate complex, which is when the enzyme and then the thing it's trying to impact come together? And once you understand that, then it kind of makes the KM a little bit more manageable because you want to understand what the KM is. So you can see that as you keep layering on these topics, it makes it, it, makes it make a little bit more sense. So for example, the non-competitive inhibitor has no impact on the KM and that's because it has no preference on whether it's binding the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex because the KM is a measure of affinity or how likely it is to bind onto the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex. If a non-competitive inhibitor doesn't care whether it's binding the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex, then it's not going to impact the KM because it has no preference. 
it doesn't care to increase the affinity. It's going to bind either one of them. So you can see how those concepts kind of stack on each other and they make them make a good bit more sense. So we've got the 10,000 foot overview and then we've got the nuances. And lastly, it's time to kind of ruminate on the applications. And this is where I start asking myself, you know, how have I seen this tested in the past and how could this be tested in the future? So you'll imagine MCAT passages that discuss an enzyme and it may show you um, their rate of reaction, it may show you things like affinity, it may give you graphs and plots like line weaver burt plots or michaelis minton plots and ask you to apply that knowledge there a great example of this is actually amino acids so once you once you learn amino acids and you learn all their charges and things of that nature then you can start ruminating on how those could be applied and tested you start looking at the different r groups of the amino acids and you notice that they are all of these like substituents that you're used to seeing in organic chemistry. You know, you've got some hydroxyls, you've got some amides and things of that nature. You start asking yourself, well, how could this be tested? Well, go backwards and forwards in your education. If you see the amino acid, you know it's got all these different uh, side chains and these different substituents. Go backwards in your education. Go to Gen Chem. Ask yourself, how is that tested? You know, you see an OH group in Gen Chem, like your brain just pops off as like, polar it pops off as like oh well maybe that could be used as some kind of like nucleophilic attack or something of that nature in organic chemistry and you go forward in your education a little bit to like your biochems and stuff of that nature to where oh groups you know are a great great attacking group to make phosphates so now you've got all these different things stacking up for how it could be tested you know it could be tested with an oh group being polar and so maybe if you have an amino acid that is in the active side of the enzyme, then the, sub the substrate that it's gonna bind to is going to be more polar. Or maybe if they wanna test an organic chemistry principle of it, you could think about things like the peptide bond and how that is formed through the dehydration reaction. And then maybe you can go another step forward talking about referencing the phosphate situation I was talking about earlier to where OH groups are great, great attackers to create and add on a phosphate and ask yourself, okay, well, what amino acids would be likely to be phosphorylated? And then you, you, you land on things like tyrosine, serine, things of that nature. And because we've understood all of that and we've already talked about the enzyme kinetics, they could definitely give you a scenario to where they offer uh, an amino acid and all of everything at the allosteric sites is nonpolar and everything in the actual active sites are polar and then they give you a substrate that's completely polar and ask you what type of competitive inhibitor or they give you a reversible inhibitor that's completely polar and they ask you what type of reversible inhibitor is this and you know it's got to be the only one that binds at the active site so you see all these concepts kind of stack and build on each other and once you understand all of those and you learn how to simplify the question, this test becomes easy. So focusing on concepts is great. The next step though is memorizing details because there will be just a ton of facts that hit you and sometimes it's not amenable to learning the concept, which is rare, and sometimes it's just not quite as time efficient to learn the concepts juxtaposed to memorizing details. So the way that we teach the MCAT at IFD and if you've seen our courses you know that we harp on the high yield materials and our courses include like 50 ish hours of lecture discussing those high yield materials and how they're tested we go through like all three steps of, of the conceptual understanding and those videos are not available on YouTube for those of you that have been emailing me and asking they're only available in the course and so if you encounter those high yield concepts then I feel like it's a requirement that you have to learn the actual concept itself because it's just tested in a much more difficult fashion but if for example you've got like our U World XIFD high yield course and so you have both the high yield suite and the UWorld course and you're encountering like some low yield material on the UWorld questions, I would encourage you to try to learn the concept. And then if it's, you know, if you're just stuck staring at the same concept for 15, 20, 30 minutes and it's just not clicking and you know that you can just make one flashcard and memorize it all, I would probably suggest to do that, right? Because at the end of the day, I want you to have a life. I want this MCAT process to be over with click quickly but the most important thing to me is that you get your score on the first try or on your next try and that you don't have to worry about this test anymore um, and that you build good habits for when you get into medical school because there's really not one correct way to study in medical school but there are definitely better ways than others 
and there there's so much material that's getting thrown at you you're gonna want to have good study strategies built in whenever you get to medical school and, and and really the entirety of med school like for the most part feels like you're studying for a standardized exam because it's not like you know i, I can't just like the gross anatomy that I learned first semester of M1 year, I still use every single day in the operating room. So you can't just like pump it and dump it like you can for um, chair and boat confirmations or something like that on the MCAT or, or on an OCHEM test. I mean, you really have to memorize it and, and uh, or you really have to retain it all rather than memorizing it. So having good study strategies makes the MCAT a whole lot easier. So this video is about memorization and its utility and how to properly do that. And we, I started with conceptual learning because that's most important. But when we're discussing memorization specifically, there are some tools that you really need to be using if you don't already use them. Um, one of those tools are mnemonics. Some people are really big fans of like making your own mnemonics and they're convinced they stick better. Uh, maybe that's true for some people, but not for me. I mean, like I've tried everything. I've tried even like making dirty mnemonics uh, to see if they stick, and I they didn't stick. Instead, I just had these like weird, obscene flashcards in my Anki deck, and I'm like, that's disgusting. Why would I ever think that that would be helpful? I like mnemonics that have been made by other people. And bonus points is if you can have a mnemonic that relates to the science itself so that whenever you encounter that word, it kind of triggers that mnemonic in your brain. So mnemonics are great for memorization. And the other tool, and this is what I use the most, it's what we recommend in our courses. Um, it's not something you have to do, but it's something that's really, really helpful, and that's flashcards. And the application that we use is called Anki, A-N-K-I. Uh, we use pre-made decks, and it's very time consuming. You have to do it every single day. And some people just absolutely loathe it. You've got like two camps, people that praise and worship Anki, and then people that just absolutely hate it. And my personal experience with Anki is that it's been really, really great for my MCAT students. And I used it to study for step one, but then third year of med school hit and it's just so busy. You know, you like you, you, you have clinical duties, some rotations only for 40 hours a week, but you know, there's some rotations where like you were gonna be either in the operating room or in clinic or at the hospital for like anywhere between 60, sometimes 80 hours, not usually. And then you have to do your practice questions, like two hours worth of practice questions a day. And really, like, I just didn't have time to do an additional two hours worth of Anki every single day because, you know, I have a family, I've got a business that I have to tend to, and, you know, any other excuse. I like to lift weights, and uh, even though you can't tell, uh, things of that nature. I try to be human too. But mnemonics and flashcards are great for memorization. Some things that I don't think work very well is like rewriting it. I mean like, yeah, you kind of learn it, but it's just so time expensive. And the problem with like writing out everything is that you never go back and read it. I mean, how many times have you taken pages worth of notes and then never reread them and convinced yourself like, oh, well, it was worth the three hours it took me to write out, to rewrite that lecture because you know, I retained some of that information. Well, maybe you retained 80% of it, but if you had taken that three hours it took you to rewrite the lecture, and you just put it into some flashcards that takes you like 10 minutes to do, and you can review those, and it only takes you, you know, five or 10 minutes every single day to review those, but well, you're gonna memorize 100% of it because you're gonna be seeing those concepts frequently, and then you're going to uh, retain that information for a whole lot longer. So I don't think that rewriting works very well, um, although I'm open to the idea that it might work for you, and that's completely fine. And then this free bonus tip uh, for once you've conceptualized the material and once you've memorized the material, you've got to practice applying it because the MCAT itself is like, it doesn't test you on straight up factoids. You have to A, figure out the science they're actually testing you on, which is a lot harder than it feels, than it sounds like to like read a question, figure out what science they're testing you on. And then, B, you're gonna have to like apply it to a unique or a weird scenario. And that's why in my like conceptual understanding portion of the video, I discussed like trying to guess how they're gonna test you basically. It's a really important exercise because it kind of stretches your brain a little bit. So if you're about to study for the MCAT, there are two ways to learn material. There's two different methods to learning materials and you can't get away without either one of them. You've gotta conceptualize all the materials, especially the high yield materials. If you don't know which those materials are, you can go on our website and you can look at like our course or even our books. And if you click through the pictures, then like we included the table of contents so that you can see the subjects that we think are high yield. 
Um, you know, I'd obviously prefer if you bought it, but I, I don't want money to be a barrier to you being a physician. But regardless how you choose to learn them, you've got to learn all of those concepts. And then for the low yield concepts or the things that are just too time expensive for you to conceptualize, or maybe they just like, they're not amenable to conceptualizing the specific detail that they need. Like for example, um, Planck's constant. Like you can't conceptualize what number that's gonna be. You just got to memorize stuff like that. Um, and so I think flashcards are a great way to do it. And I think that mnemonics, when you can use a mnemonic, is a very great way to do that as well. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. You know, we're really trying to do a big impact on the MCAT industry. It's very confusing. And a lot of times students feel like they're like piecemealing material because the only other option is to spend like, you know, $6,000 on like a full course and things of that nature. So we're trying to make this advice and the like professional expertise a little bit more attainable. You know, we'll never be able to make it all free, but as much as we can, we're going to get it to you. And it would mean the world to us if you would take the time to just send our YouTube channel to your pre-med advisor or one of the pre-med groups that you are affiliated with. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.